Okay, welcome to a new repair video where we are going to take a look at this RCA CTC 10 that works but has sync problems and this Zenith 24 NC31 that I believe also works but has uh, unknown problems seeing as how I just got it. Put negative up to a convenient chassis ground point and That doesn't help the hum. We're going to look at both of these sets and we're going to get both of them into good working order. So stick around. So the CTC-10 here, I very act up shortly after getting it and it produced a full raster. The electrolytics remained cool after about an hour of operation and the screen was filled and uh, there was colored demodulator activity and so on. But the horizontal sink is almost non-existent and the vertical sink is less than ideal. So what we're going to start off by doing is turning on a light so we can see stuff. We're going to start off by doing is replacing this horizontal AFC diode right here. That is a common problem of horizontal synchronization issues in all television sets that use a solid state diode for that purpose. And we're going to use 1N5711 shot key diodes to replace it. Well, I will understand this by looking at the schematic. The cathode ends connect together, and those are the dashed ends effectively. Oh, and I need my... I want my... I need my... Give me your MTV. Come back. Oh, 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 oh
occurs to me I should probably show the symptom before I replace the part that I believe is causing it. So here we're duplicating the problem. I can adjust the horizontal hold control. I can sort of get it to sort of semi-float in place, but it isn't stable. So clearly we have insufficient horizontal sync. So this is a CTC-10 SAM schematic. This is the horizontal AFC diode right here, this uh, M7 part. It's a common cathode. I believe the middle pin will be the cathode pin. Um, and one end goes to a 68 picofarad capacitor and a 150K resistor. And the other end goes to ground. So that's clearly this guy right here. I probably will test that diode after I get it out of circuit. You know, I got two of its leads out of circuit. We'll make a huge mess getting our multimeter out. Let's just go to diode mode and try to learn what we can about this. 118. Oh, that's resistance mode. Diode mode 0 0.120 volts direct current. And this side tested briefly okay and then died. Yeah, I do believe this diode is bad. This has got to be one of the more awkward positions I've had to physically work in in recent memory on any TV. I could make this easier on myself in terms of reaching this component if I removed the chassis or bothered to yank the chassis to the absolute limits of how far back and over it can go, but Rather than push the limits when it's not necessarily needed, I'm just going to relax and do the minimum I need to achieve what I want to achieve. That feeling when you know where you want your soldering iron to go, but you don't have quite enough room to get it to go there. How much footage I'm getting in the back of my head right now. Probably way too much. So the new horizontal AFC diodes are in and we have nice stable horizontal sync. If you let me see if I can film me adjusting this control. close to a turn in either direction that it moves before it loses sync. That is pretty good. So I think we've cured the sync. Um, we do have faint color coming through. It was stronger before, but that was when it was set to another channel and I could access the fine tuning control and uh, color and tint controls. Right now if the chassis is halfway out of the cabinet, I can't easily do that, but I will do that shortly. I'm going to verify that the audio is good. And once I've verified the audio is good, I'll put the chassis back in far enough that I can put the right knobs on and I can dial in fine tuning to where it needs to be. It. Yeah, which is going to happen first, the PlayStation 2 reading the disc and doing the track list, or the 
tamarack warming up and giving me a picture. That was a sign. for glorious lollipop color. A little bit too glorious and a little bit too vivid, though. <sighs> that seems okay. The Sam's for the RCA CTC-10 is pretty cool. The cabinet they picture on the cover, I believe, is called the Corinthian. I could ask for nothing beyond the quality of Cordova's workmanship, the tastefulness of its appearance. I request nothing beyond the thickly cushioned luxury of seats available even in soft Corinthian leather. Or at least they called that cabinet that back in the CTC-9 generation. I actually have a working CTC-9 Corinthian elsewhere in the basement here. Um... The Corinthian cabinet was actually the Oval Office television set from the Eisenhower through the LBJ administrations. I believe LBJ replaced it with a free screen console. I don't know if the White House set was a CTC-10 or CTC-9. The CTC-9s in this cabinet supposedly were all manual tuning, which mine is, and the CTC-10s in this cabinet, which the SAM shows, were all remote sets. Um, and I've not seen a picture of the White House set with the, uh, cabinet doors open to show the screening controls, so. Okay, so before I put the back on, and, uh, tuck away the really cool original owner's manual, and, uh, the original blonde finish legs, and the 21 CYP-22 red mercury crt and all of this uh ctc 10 chassis goodness i thought i'd uh give you all a look at what is inside one of these tvs let me see if i can get a quick glow shot of all the tubes running Yeah, that's a good color. And the original back is back on. 
was missing the screw for right here. I'll see if I can find one. There's also a little spring doohickey that's supposed to hold that. I still got one, but not both of them. Okay, so now that the RCA CTC-10 is done, we're going to move on to this Zenith 24 NC31 roundy. Special thanks to uh, a collector I know who uh, sent me this uh, blue lateral magnet. I thought I didn't have a blue lateral magnet for this set because the chassis that was installed in it and the picture tube did not have one. But second parts chassis over there had a uh, blue lateral magnet uh, sitting mixed with the uh, wires on top of it that I didn't notice until after getting the other blue lateral magnet. And this is the chassis that was installed in the set. I'm fairly sure both of these are 24 NC31 chassis. One of them is an early production, one of them is a late production. The one that was in the set, and I believe is original to the set, was a later production, and the secondary parts chassis down there is an early production. Still glad I got that extra blue lateral, though, because I have numerous spare round yokes and more than one spare uh, set of purity rings for a roundy picture tube, but... I never seem to have enough uh, spare blue lateral magnets. I think I've only ever had one or two spares in my collection. It seems like every time that I end up having a spare, I end up encountering a set that needs it, and it disappears, and then I don't have another one. So, in this circumstance, now I actually have a spare to put away for a few weeks to a few months until the next set that is missing a blue lateral magnet drifts my way. So, let's get the blue lateral magnet onto this set. Okay. That seems reasonable. seems about right. Since we know this set worked to some extent under the previous owner, I'm going to put it together and give it a uh, test power up and see what it does. I do not like cobwebs. Because as much as I don't like cobwebs, I like spiders even less. don't like is this socket's kind of loose so we're gonna fix that right now there that uh, puts a little bit of strength back into the Picture tube base. So let's see here. We've got picture tube base, convergence, deflection, high voltage, tuners hooked in, the front panel controls are hooked in, the power volume switch is back here because it can be. I think aside from an antenna, this thing's ready for power. Okay, one janky improvised antenna. Power cord. I need my bearing. Let's see here. Let's 
Alright, 30 volts. Move the camera. And the antenna. Move the TV. Okay, we're at 23 watts and 41 volts. Non-linear variac action. Wattage isn't doing anything nuts though, so that's good. 58 volts. That's a little bit more in the ballpark. Two beaters are noticeably glowing. That's good. So it appears only the UHF dial light is working, so I'm going to have to change a light bulb on this set. The lucky part is my basement agile modulator is channel 13. So the UHF position on the VHF tuner is surrounded by channel 2 and channel 13. So I've got a 50% chance of uh, hitting the right channel, even not knowing whether the channels are ascending clockwise or ascending counterclockwise. You know, I could figure out where the gauss goes based on the other chassis. That would have been brilliant if I had just done it earlier. Yeah, the power consumption looks like it's tube filaments only, and I think the degauss may need to be plugged in to complete the B-plus circuit. 112 watts is not enough power draw for this set. Yeah, there's no way that that is the proper power draw for this set of B-plus, and we've got no screen action. So I think the uh, degauss is part of the B-plus circuit, and I think I know where it plugs in. So I'm going to... I'm going to take this back down to uh, 30 volts or so and try plugging the degauss in. Okay, I have no clue when the camera stopped recording, but we have a raster now. All it needed was to have the degaussing coil plugged in. The fermisters are apparently on the degauss coil of these sets uh, rather than on the chassis like the uh, previous model year Zeniths and all roundies that uh, Zenith made before this. So apparently the degauss coil is an integral part of the uh, B-plus circuit of these sets. Let me set up my handy-dandy little service mirror so I have a prayer of seeing what I'm doing. So we've got absolutely no audio. We've got no IF operation either. It's not the bell fuse. I need a schematic to deal with this properly. Okay, we do have some Okay, now we're getting tuner noise. So we must have 240 volt B plus because the... The IF and the tuner are fed from that. So is the audio, but we got no audio. I was initially thinking because there was no uh, snow that... Uh, There might be no low B plus line, but there's got to be low B plus. I wonder if my speaker's bad. I've clearly got multiple problems going on at once, which doesn't help troubleshooting. At least it usually doesn't help troubleshooting. Sometimes it does. If all of the troubles point to the same point, if they don't, it doesn't do me any good. Also, a little bit low on line voltage. That might be a problem. Let's put it to 119 volts. Oh, there we go. Now we got static. Ah, oh, there we are. It's definitely passing video. A lot of stuff's not right, but it's passing video. That's good. Still got no audio, and that bothers me, so I'm going to hook up a speaker and see what happens. I should say an additional test speaker. Audio stage is stone dead. There's nothing coming through the output, so that's going to need to be troubleshooted. Troubleshot. It's going to be trouble. All the trouble. So the chassis isn't far enough forward. That might be where it belongs. Let me see if I can get the knobs to... I 
feels like a control shaft. Oh yeah, that's a control shaft. Now, I need a horizontal hold if you'll let me. Come on, I feel ya. Come on, work with me here. I'm just staring into the void looking for a control shift that I can feel but I can't see. The nice part about having two likely restorable chassis for this set is I don't have to worry about breaking anything. If I destroy anything on this chassis, including the flyback, I have a complete spare. Why won't you connect? There we go. Now we have knob engagement. There we are. Horizontal hold achieved. Come on, vertical hold. Okay, there's vertical hold. Don't know if I'm still filming, if you can see the test pattern, but... Yeah, I'm still filming. And we have a test pattern. It looks terrible, but... This is a starting point. Okay, so we have a test pattern. Brightness works. Contrast pot's a little bit dirty at the top end. Sink is really not that stable, but it does have it. Tuning feels like it's free spinning and not doing a darn thing. Yeah, that should have resistance. It shouldn't freewheel like that. Something's definitely wrong with the fine tuning mechanism. We have some semblance of chroma demodulation, but synchronization is junk. And convergence is clearly pretty far out to lunch. I need a service mirror to. Try to rough the convergence in slightly. Now that's roughly convergence. Okay. That makes it look less awful. That's good. It's decent for a rough convergence setup. Let's turn chroma level up. Mm, you can see it barber pulling and trying. This huge ripple on the side of the screen indicates an electrolytic is uh, pretty well out to lunch. I'm gonna have to find that. I have my suspicions since one section of, I believe, C2 has been replaced. A 100 microfarad lytic. What is the coil for chroma oscillator in this one? So it looks like it uses a 6KT8 for the chroma oscillator. And it looks like the coil to adjust it is A19. Who's A19? Come on, tell me your secrets. Okay, here's the map of the adjustments. There's a 19, where does it point to? Okay. Points to that hole in the chassis. Back there. Okay. I'm 
I'm doing this way out of order, I should really be addressing the B-plus issue before I mess with this, but I want to see those sweet, sweet uh, color bars on screen and in sync. Ah, slug feels like it's almost frozen, which isn't helping life. I wonder how bad it is on the other set. On the other set, it's nice and free. That's good. So one thing that running it like this will help me with is I can feel the electrolytic cans for heat after it's been on a few minutes and see if any of them are heating up. That may give me a hint as to which one is the uh, culprit. Okay, continuing on our process of dealing with the uh, last things first. We uh, have a more suitable test pattern to adjust a chroma oscillator with and I shot a little bit of uh, my favorite control cleaner down the uh, slug pathway for the uh, chroma oscillator adjustment. This stuff breaks down wax, which I think might be in that slug adjustment, uh, and it did seem to help free it up, so we're now going to... Uh, That sure looks like color bars to me. That's perlatively stable. Fine tunings out to lunch, which is making even getting color signal in strongly difficult. The hue adjustment is also out to lunch. It's time I start actually trying to make the uh, B plus not have hum in it because this is just completely unacceptable. Before I do that I'll pull the tuner. I gotta pull the tuner. Figure out why the fine tuning isn't working. That's gonna annoy me too. So I missed it earlier but the uh, fine tuning mechanism is completely missing. I'm guessing it was like this when I took it apart for the uh, winter cataract removal video. You can see this gear has absolutely nothing to connect into. There should be something in this spot here and there's nothing. <sighs> Luckily for me, get my cell phone. <sighs> Come on, you stinking cell phone. Turn your flashlight off. Thank you. So, lucky for me, I have a horde of Zenith tuners like this one here, which will probably be able to donate a fine tuning mechanism to me, or rather to this set. I need to do some looking at some stuff before I make a final decision, though. So this one, this piece looks shallower. This piece should be farther out from the face of the tuner, I think, on the tuner that is in the set. I'll play around and figure out what I need and where to get it. I found another Zenith tuner in my stash. This guy here, I think this was part of this at one point. Yeah, this was. The uh, fine tuning mech here appears to be interchangeable. I am going to try to harvest this and transplant it onto my other set. So the fine tuning on. That's great. Drop the screw on the floor, Tom. You'll never find it again if you do that. Okay. Oh, so that just comes off like that. Hmm. Oh, I 
I see there's like a friction clutch on it. That's neat. Need extra lighting. So, these look like identical parts aside from this one missing its most important pieces. I mean, this mechanism is mostly metal and it just has a little plastic gear on the end. It shouldn't just come apart like that. It's really weird that that's broken on this set. Well, maybe I'll be happier not thinking about it. Okay. That just gets loose when that's not there. That's interesting. So I think that, yeah, the metal rides in the little groove on the fine tuning mech. That's kind of neat. This sucker in here like that. And okay, I think both of those are started. That's lovely. Okay, it feels like I have actual fine-tuning action. That's nice. The dial light is underneath this little plastic, this little metal sleeve. Um, you're supposed to push it backwards and slide it off, but it wasn't cooperating, so I just bent it down slightly, slid the sleeve off, and uh, swapped the little bayonet-based bulb. Yeah, don't, don't wreck your channel indicator plate, Tom. You only got. One nice example of that. Okay, so I guess I'll put this back on my parts tuner. We'll see if we have some type of fine tuning in just a minute. So let's get that tuner back in there. Can I even film that? Um, this is gonna be so sketch. Yeah, so I think you can kind of see the three screw mounts that this tuner goes into. Um, what in the... Don't catch on the gears now. That makes my life harder. So that's where it should go. And this is where the... Uh, this right here is where the volume control pot should go into. There's this little clip on the front of it that the camera won't focus on that you can pull off to get it off easier or you can pluck the four wires off of the pot. Let's power this up and see what it does. And we actually have uh, a crude channel indicator light working. looking a little bit better. Something's up with the yellow and uh, I believe it's the yellow and the cyan bars? Yeah, the yellow and cyan are out of whack, but green, uh, purple, red, and blue are spot on. Could be a color purity issue. Could be a demodulator issue. The tubes. Yeah. Let's 
So we have Zenith 6JH8 demodulator pack. We have an RY and a BY. Let's swap demodulator tubes for shits and giggles. So. Oh, yeah, don't drop it on the floor. That's not a... That's clearly not the issue. Things are definitely wacky though. So we've got cyan, but we don't have any strength in the yellow bar. That's just bizarre. So we've definitely got color demodulator issues, I think. That's definitely cyan, but this isn't yellow, and it should be yellow. It's just weird. And we also have absolutely no sound. Which is frustrating. It's getting late, so what I'm probably going to do is try to get a couple of the chassis bolts on this in and see if I can get the cabinet up onto the uh, bench on its side. There's a big hatch in the bottom of the cabinet underneath the chassis, the uh, service saver hatch. With that off and the chassis bolted in and the cabinet on its side, I can access everything under chassis with the chassis in cabinet, which makes life a lot nicer. And I think I'll proceed to servicing it with things in that configuration. Okay, time to watch me try to do something very laborious and relatively dumb. Zenith's famous service saver chassis. It's not a back saver chassis though. This is how it was intended to be used. Except you're supposed to turn it over on a floor and not lift it onto your workbench like an idiot. Details, details. I'll do more stuff with this tomorrow. My back tells me I'm stupid and tired. Okay, so we have the Zenith Roundy on the bench. I think the first thing I should do now that it's in a good position where I can get at the filter capacitors is try to brute force a answer to why the uh, why the raster is shrunk and has hum in it. Since this set uses basically 450 volt capacitors is its highest value. Zenith actually uses 475 volt capacitors, but the highest B plus rail that those are on is a 340 volt rail, so the extra the extra 125 volts is basically safety factor for the longevity of the lytics, and 450 would suffice. Now we can power it up. What I'm going to do is slightly dangerous. I have this 68 microfarad 450 volt lytic here. I've got nice polarized wires hooked up to it. The uh, negative on it's grounded. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump its positive to the positive of each can lytic that has its negative tied to chassis. And I'm going to Observe, I think you can sort of see the uh, 
the ripple on the what is effectively the top edge of the uh, picture tube with its cabinet on its side. That ripple there is uh, AC hum in the uh, sets B plus circuitry. Not sure which B plus circuitry. What I'm first going to do is jump this capacitor in parallel with the 100 microfarad capacitor that someone changed previously on this set. There's probably going to be a little spark in doing this. Oh, that perked it right up. Okay, so we know that 100 microfarad that someone changed has went bad. And that makes some sense because that capacitor has a spot where it's uh, blue plastic insulative sheeting over the can has uh, popped apart. And that's usually a sign on capacitors that if they haven't gone bad, they're about to go bad. Although it's often a sign that a capacitor has actually gone bad. I want an antenna hooked up so we can also see the signal behavior of this set. Of course the chroma sync is off, because why would it not be off? What in the... Well, actually, there's nothing that says I can't do this. That's interesting that the horizontal hold static point is as wrong as it seems to be. That will definitely need to be addressed, but before we get to that, I'm going to change on that Linux. So let's pull the power so that the B Plus doesn't have active electricity to shock me with. Because I don't like getting shocked. Let me show you the cap that's failed. You see this, uh, modern blue capacitor that's 100 micro at 250 volts and how the plastic casings come off of it. Jumping a new cap across that's getting us back a uh, hum free um, fuller horizontal so clearly this capacitor's failed and it is the circular section of C2. If C2 is still the original can we can Look that up in the SAMs. Electrolytic capacitors. C2. That originally was an 80 microfarad at 475 volts. And it's this cap right here that filters the 340 volt source. So, since I don't have any 475 volt or higher lytics in stock, I'm going to use a 450. Again, it's a 340 volt supply. The 25 volts difference between the cap I have and the cap that was originally in there is negligible. And both of those caps are over 100 volts higher in voltage rating than the rail is ever going to get. So they have both 450 and 475 in this particular application have more than enough safety factor. So we'll just use one of these guys to replace it. Okay, let's see if we can light this well enough to document what we're doing. Yes and no. That might work. work. Well, we'll find out. So, I don't like that this cap that's failed has a floating connection made by whoever changed it. This probably isn't going to be a problem, but it's not the tidiest thing, and in some cases it can become a problem, so I try to avoid doing those, especially where there's a lot of flop to the leads. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a terminal strip to this chassis. I'm going to solder it on to effectively the negative lug of a can right here. Uh, that lug also is a also is connected to the chassis and is a chassis tie point, so I should just be able to use my big old 
80 watt soldering iron to make a nice lead bead here. Okay, that new terminal strips in there solidly and it's also easily removed, which is good. Now I'm going to take the failed capacitor out and I know why this capacitor failed. This is a 340 volt B plus rail, but someone used a 250 volt capacitor on it. That is not sufficient for the job. When changing out a this is also interesting. This terminal lug had some other component lead on it before, but that component was taken out in this. There are some interesting things that went on when this uh, cap was installed. But as I was saying earlier, this is a 250 volt cap and someone installed it on a 340 volt rail. When the rail voltage that a cap is on is significantly higher than the cap is rated for, the cap's going to fail. The absolute minimum that I would install in this application for a, 300 volt, for a 340 volt B plus rail is a 350 volt capacitor. And really a 400 or 450 is a better part for the job. This 250 volt cap that somebody installed was basically doomed to failure from the moment someone tacked it in as a replacement. And if you look carefully at this cap, you can actually see that the rubber end plug is bulged. So this this cap is completely dead. It's hitting the round file. Now I want to figure out where is going to be the cleanest place for me to mount my 100 microfarad cap to this terminal strip. Um, I like this angle pretty well. I still have decent access to the remaining section of the original can that's still there. So when that eventually fails I can reach it easily. So we got rid of the hum waviness that was here by changing that capacitor. Chroma hold is uh, Still interesting. Yeah, for that matter, I don't even know if the tubes are good. I'm going to test the horizontal oscillator tube. I'm going to test the horizontal oscillator tube. And I think also the chroma oscillator tube. And the audio output and demodulator tube. Actually, I think that tube might be the entire audio section. I'm going to test those three tubes. And... Make sure that they're all right before I proceed to deeper troubleshooting. Okay, tube testers warmed up. So we have two 6KT8s. One is the uh, chroma oscillator. The other is the uh, sound IF amplifier tube, the first one, and a sound and sync amplifier tube. That could potentially contribute to the mediocre sync issues. We have the 6U10 horizontal oscillator and the uh, 6Z10 audio demodulator and output. What's interesting is the SAMS calls for a 6DJ8 and the tube chart calls for a 6Z10. So either they're identical tubes with slightly different numbering or there was a production change that uh, the SAMS doesn't completely note. So, 6KD8. Let's see if Katie's a good girl or not. 628. 6, 2 and 7, and socket 2. I really hope it's not the uh, KD-8s, because I don't have a lot of those. section that has, I believe, its grid is pin 2, which I think is what C corresponds to on this B&K Dynajet 606 tester. Um, 
The section that has its grid is two appears to have good healthy emissions. No grid emission issues. I'll rotate slowly for shorts and then test the other section which is on pin 7. And that's good and healthy, although it's declining a bit. You're not having your heater go out on me, are you? You're not. So why is your emission slumping? Is it a bad socket connection? Is it a grid emission issue? No, because the needle would stay up in the grid emission test if it was a grid emission issue. This is just a low quality tube. Crud, now I'm going to have to dig up a good 6KT8. The problem about digging up tubes like this from the used pile is oftentimes you have to find two or three used ones to find a good used one. Now it's climbing back up in emission. It does eliminate the spare used tubes but that are duds doing that, but it still is time consuming, especially when you have a hard time finding the first one. Oh, and it's shorted. That's what's wrong with it. Now we have hard grid emission. Okay, so this 6KT8 is not good. Bad, Katie. You bad girl. Let's try the other Katie. See if she's any livelier. This KD is the uh, chroma oscillator tube, and I actually expect it to be bad because of how unstable the chroma oscillator is. It's still climbing, at least. This has a very slow warm-up time, though. This is a tube that could potentially benefit from being swapped for uh, a new tube at some point in time with how slow its warm-up characteristics are, but at least on this half of the tube it seems to be good enough. I'm gonna wait till it stops climbing. Yeah, this half seems fine. No grid emission issues, no shorts on that element. Rotate the C1, see if the shorts light comes on. Um, so far the verdict is the SoundSync 6KT8. Katie's a bad girl. She needs to, uh, Get swapped out for a different KD. The uh, Chrome Oscillator 6KD8, fine. So that's not our Chroma problem. The uh, 6U10 Horizontal Oscillator is uh, weak on the pin 9 grid uh, section, which is the horizontal discharge tube on the schematic. So this is going to uh, potentially need replacement. It's still strong enough for the set to run, but and it's probably not causing the horizontal skew, but it might be. So I should change it just to eliminate that issue, or at least temporarily sub it for a different tube. Next we're going to test the 6Z10, which is 630-619 for the first section. 636. One and socket number nine. 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 That is a slow warm up. You're bad, aren't you? If you're not bad, you sure want to pretend that you're bad. I think this is the output section based on the A being set to 30 instead of being set to 95. Normally, more sane middle of the road values are used on amplifier tubes, and the high value like 95 is used for Zenith's uh, buzzomatic detector stage, which is the other section of the tube that I haven't tested yet. So, the output on this tube is clearly. Uh, pretty weak. It's not dead, and I've seen power output tubes that will produce usable audio output even when they're down to like 30 on the scale, which is lower than this one by a good margin, but it definitely wouldn't be having full audio performance like that. Let's toggle over to the number six position for the detector stage and crank 
dial up almost all the way. So the detector stage on this tube is actually still happy. The fact that the audio output is completely dead and unplugging this tube and plugging it back in doesn't even result in any speaker noise. Hints to me that there are other problems in the circuit beyond just the tube being weak. So, I figured out that the audio output transformer on this television is open. If I power the setup like it is right now, clip my voltmeter to a nice ground, I measure the plate voltage to the, or not the plate voltage, the screen voltage to the audio output transformer, I get 231 volts, which is within about 11 volts a spec, and if I connect to the plate, which should be about 210 volts, I get zero volts on the plate. So, the audio output transformer is probably open, and I did confirm it and will reconfirm it since I suspect I didn't film that section somehow. Thanks, Nikon camera. Thank you for not filming when I want you to film. And if we measure the continuity across the primary of the audio output transformer, we've got open circuit. So the audio output transformer is dead. It's got an open primary. We've got a spare parts chassis, so it, replacing it will be fairly trivial, just four wires. And that tells us why we had absolutely nothing coming out of the speaker when we unplugged or plugged in the audio output tube. You're not going to get audio in the uh, audio output transformer primary shot. This is the audio output tube. There's supposed to be 210 volts on the plate and 220 volts on the screen grid right here. There was zero volts on the plate, which indicates that this primary winding on the transformer that's supposed to be 230 ohms went open and it did indeed test open. Okay, so I've replaced the audio output transformer with one that doesn't have an open primary. The secondary also tests good on it, so theoretically if the rest of the audio circuitry on this television is okay and if the tuner and IF pass signal We'll probably get a uh, we'll probably get sound through this set any day now. There we go. Now we have some audio coming through. So why in the heck do we not have any? I've got no mirror to see what I'm doing while I'm playing with adjustments. That's not helpful at all. You really have to pick now to have. No signal passing through, don't you? Well, fine, we'll get out the B&K analyst and we'll jam signal down your pie hole till you tell us why you're unhappy. Man, we got nothing coming out of this thing. The IF input's around there. I think the grid is just the first pin on that tube. So it looks like Pin 2 of the first video IF tube is essentially where the IF comes in. I can't reach the direct IF input on this set with the way the chassis wraps around, but I can connect my generator here. And that's getting us a uh, signal. frequency, you can see that we have some picture coming through. So clearly the failure in this set is the tuner. That pisses me off slightly. Well, I guess now I test the tuner tubes before I go on to, uh, it almost sounded like the tuner briefly worked as the power was edging down, but I, I don't know. So the 6HA5 in the tuner was dead. That's about maximum audio that it can produce, which is a little bit weak for a set like this. This is interesting. 
So we have yellow down here on this yellow portion, but this yellow on the uh, color bars is weak. No clue how well this picks up on the camera. It looks like we still have hum in the uh, B plus circuitry, but we've got audio and we've got basically synchronized color. Can I reduce the buzz? That helps a bit. So we definitely have hum in the B plus circuitry, which at least I think we do. I drop the AGC a little bit if that'll help with the Definitely have B plus hum remaining in this thing. Horizontal centering itself up better, so that might not be a problem anymore. I'm gonna try bridging some more lytics and see what that uh, gets me. negative up to a convenient chassis ground point and that doesn't help the hum doesn't help the hum. It doesn't help the hum. doesn't help the hum either. That doesn't help the hum. That doesn't help the hum. Every major lytic in the set, except for the what I believe is a doubler lytic, 
Yeah, that's a voltage doubler. I guess I could try the voltage doubler, Lytic. Let's see here. Negative goes to negative. Yeah, it's not doing anything on the doubler letic either. So, I'm not sure where that slight hum in the picture is coming from. Comes from it not knowing the words. Could also be coming from my agile modulator. The basement one is at the point where it might need some new electrolytics in it. Some sets are more sensitive to the hum it has than others. I don't get why the uh, yellow on this pattern is so weak compared to the rest of the colors when we have solid yellow down here. Maybe something to look into. Audio's buzzy and there's some type of hum leaking in. I'm not sure if it's an HK short on a tube or if it's my Agile modulator, which does sometimes produce hum effects. Some of those hum effects are actually caused by ghosting down here in the basement, there's basically posts that support the central girder of the house, and those will create uh, ghosts and RF echoes and other weird phenomena that uh, create weird RF symptoms. Move the antenna around and change behavior. One of the things I've learned is the uh, best time to adjust uh, the chroma oscillator for sync is when you have such weak color that it wants to desync. Okay, so I've determined on the Zenith Roundy that I think it's working about properly. It clearly has purity issues and convergence issues. The purity issues, I think, are contributing to that uh, strange uh, condition where, where the yellow on the color bar stripe of the test pattern is not quite the right yellow. It's kind of weak but the bottom one looks normal. I think what is responsible for that is a purity issue in the picture tube 
causing a weakening of the uh, yellow in the localized spot where the test pattern happened to have it. So I'm going to put this set down on the ground and then run it through a complete purity and convergence setup and take you along for that ride. Before I do that though, I thought I'd go over some production changes between the 20 between the 24NC31 and the 24NC31Z. This sets a 24NC31Z and a couple of things you can do to tell that from a glance. A couple of things that distinguish the 24NC31 from the 31Z at a glance is the Z, which is the later chassis, does not have a circuit breaker and instead has a bell fuse right here for the B+. Zenith was quite fond of these into the late 70s, these bell fuses. The 24NC31 is nominally a 1966 set. Um, it's possible Zenith might have continued this chassis in production for another year or more in order to have a loss leader set and use up supplies of roundy picture tubes and bezels. I don't know that to be the case, I'm just speculating. But this bell fuse here is the earliest example of a bell fuse I'm familiar with in the Zenith television. So they introduced bell fuses in 1966 or shortly thereafter. The other thing you can tell at a glance above chassis is that it's a Z chassis is this white picture tube base connector. This white removable picture tube base connector. Um, I'm pretty sure this is original to this set because it has the crimped on uh, spade connectors that can be unplugged for the the grids here and the cathodes here are unpluggable. Um, they hardwired the the G2 leads, the uh, heater leads, and the focus wire. But um, yeah, I don't think aftermarket uh, picture tube bases would have th this nice of connectors attached to them. Maybe if Zenith made some aftermarket parts. Um, and the Z chassis also under chassis has this clear delay line with its part number uh, S652996. S652996. Delay line part number stamped on it. Um, if we go over to. And this is heavy. As it should be. If we go over to the old 24NC31 chassis, the older version, it has a circuit breaker right here, which I actually like slightly better than the bell fuses. Um, it uses a black with red back style um, CRT base. Uh, this is the old style that they used on older chassis than this from previous model years. Also, I noticed that the older one has an R stamp near the circuit breaker, and the Z chassis has an M stamp near the circuit breaker. I think those are chassis revision numbers, or perhaps some other indication. Um, otherwise, above chassis, they're basically identical. There is no bell fuse stamping in the chassis on the older version. They didn't even think to stamp it for that. So they clearly hadn't introduced the bell fuse as a thing yet. Um, one cool thing you can do if you don't have bell fuses, can't find bell fuses, they're pretty hard to find, to be honest, is you can sometimes find these old... Uh, Workman Sansa Fuse bell fuse replacements. They've got a bell fuse bottom on them and they have a circuit breaker built in. Um, 
you could theoretically also on a burned out bell fuse. I have a spare. I have a couple of spare bell fuses. I got three or four spare bell fuses in here. Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me! Oh, hear me! All pay heed! The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these fifteen. Oi. Ten! Ten commandments for all to obey! On these bell fuses, you if the fuse is burnt out, you could pry the plastic off after noting what the fuse's amperage and voltage is. And you could use the plug-in connector on the bottom of the bell fuse as terminals to connect a circuit breaker with the same rating as what the fuse had, and you could effectively make your own Workman Sansa fuse if you can't find the correct Workman Sansa fuse, which themselves probably aren't that common anymore. And here we see the bottom of the older 24NC31 non-Z chassis, and you can see that we have a black delay line there are probably a handful of other uh, there are probably a handful of other differences under here. Um, the circuit breaker is obviously one that uh, jumps out at you. Um, the other one I'm remembering now is this is light blue. The horizontal hold coil is light blue with a green winding, and on the newer revision, it's a darker blue with a red winding. So those are the production change differences. So now I'm going to proceed to uh, take the big set down from my workbench and actually before I do that I need to bolt the bottom pan up don't I? Zenith's uh, famous service saver cover. Um, four screws that hold the chassis in. This one, this one, this one, and one right under here, which is interesting in that it's outboard of the uh, side rail. Whatever. I want all my chassis screws to be where they belong, and I want my bottom cover screws to be numerous enough to keep this thing from rattling around. I'm not going to do that one because it's in a tight, hard to get to spot. Frankly, I think that the other screws around it will probably do a good enough job holding it in. I do want the ones that I put in there to be in there so that it's secure. Okay, time to get this Zenith back down on the floor. Uh, that's back on terra firma. I can plug it in and work on getting purity and convergence set up. Uh, of course it doesn't reach. That would be too easy. I bet purity is way up to lunch. Let's confirm that. Oh yeah. 
So this should be a pure red field right here. And right now we have pretty gross impurities. Pretty gross indeed. So let's degauss that and then try to run it through purity procedure. Now this set does have a built-in self-degaussing coil, but those don't always work perfectly, especially when a set's been moved significantly with respect to the orientation of Earth's magnetic field, so it's just... Technically, you want to have the degaussing coil plugged in far away from the set, but that's not easy here, so we're not going to do that that way. Path reception wreaking havoc on color reception world over. Okay, so I need a service mirror. Where is my sir? Oh, of course, my service mirror is over here. Why would it be any place where it would not be hard to get at? see what I'm looking at. Kindly shut up. <laughs> so. I think that roughly centers the what should be a red dot in the center of the screen, but the yoke is not quite far enough back to adequately make said dot. Unless I yank on it like that. It does look centered now. There we go. That looks a lot better. I did just now. This thing right here through right here is the deflection yoke. It moves the beams from the electron guns around the screen horizontally and vertically. This next thing here with the three colored petals on it is the convergence yoke. It adjusts the relative deflection of the red, green, and blue to keep them close together throughout the screen. The convergence yoke I'll discuss in a little bit. Next is the purity rings here, and this is the blue lateral magnet. So, to achieve purity on one of these sets, you want to have a full red screen. Um, most service procedures tell you to turn the green and blue G2 controls, or screen controls, depending on the nomenclature your set uses. Most literature tells you to turn the red and blue down to nothing, and just use the red on a blank raster. But you can also, if you have a test parent generator that will give you a pure red uh, video signal, you could also leave the screens as they are and use a red video signal to adjust purity. What you then need to do is drag the deflection yoke back as close to the uh, convergence yoke as you can get it and use the purity rings. There are two different rings and if you look there are two different tabs here and here for the two different rings. You adjust the tabs relative to each other closer and further away and you can also rotate them both together to rotate the rings together around the neck of the tube and use that to center the red dot in the middle of the screen. Then once the red dot is centered in the middle of the screen you carefully slide the deflection yoke forward until there's uniform red purity throughout the screen. Now you don't have to use red as your adjusting color. You can use green or you can use blue, but you want it to be one of the three primaries, red, green, and blue. You don't want it to be any other color that's a mixture of them. So some more information about the convergence yokes. There's static and dynamic convergence. Static convergence, these little uh, 
white levers on each of the pedals, adjust the color of the pedal of the yoke in the direction that the magnet points. So, red and green move diagonally, and you want to converge those first when doing static convergence, because they're the, hard, the two hardest to get to come together. Blue actually moves in two axes. The adjustment on the pedal moves it up and down, and this blue lateral magnet right here, this adjustment, moves it side to side. So once you get red and green to overlap perfectly to make yellow, you can then adjust blue to overlap with the yellow to get perfect white. Now these controls only affect the center of the picture, these static controls. The yoke adjust the dynamic convergence, which is adjusted by this board here that uh, connects via these wires to the yoke. And that has a complex procedure to adjust the dynamic convergence on the edges of the screen. Most of these controls will interact with each other to some extent or another, and also to some extent or another uh, depend on previous sequences of adjustments to be more or less accurate. So there can be a lot of iteration doing the dynamic convergence on one of these sets. And sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get the entire screen to have perfect convergence, but usually usually if you can get the convergence good to within about this close to the edge of the screen all the way around, you're doing really good. That would be about as good as it would be expected to be on a brand new set. So, now that we have good purity, there we go. Now that looks really good. Can I make it any better? I mean, that looks, damn, that looks good. I probably do need to touch up the uh, convergence a little bit, but with the purity right, the color rendition looks great. And just look at that. Yellow's yellow, the green's green, the red's red, the, uh, just looks right looks really right. Enough appreciating my own work and tooting my own horn. Stop appreciating things so much, damn it, and finish your job. Okay. Uh, get the off done. I can be negative. I don't like the tangles I'm dealing with on my test pattern generator cords. That's more like it, be negative. Turn the color level down to nothing. Can I? Is there a way of? No, it's not quite it. Okay, so we're all set up to start attacking the convergence on this. The best foundation for getting perfect convergence on one of these sets is getting the static convergence as good as you possibly can. Now, I'm going to unplug one of the 
one of the spade connectors for the blue gun to extinguish the blue gun briefly so that I can start to deal with this. Okay, that's about as perfect as I think I can get the red green in the center. Let's get blue hooked back up and try to get blue balls on. Damn it, quit doing the macarena while I'm trying to adjust you. Crappy antenna connectors. Seriously? You're seriously gonna do this right now? Okay, that gets the center about as good as it's going to be. If I recall correctly, what I want to do as a procedure is do the red-green vertical and horizontal, then the blue horizontal, 
and then go over to the uh, variable inductors. So, that's affecting the bottom. Well, it's affecting the top and the bottom. Okay. Just that's not too bad. So blue horizontal top and bottom. Well, clearly, dynamic convergence is taking a lot longer than eight minutes. I have no clue when the camera stopped or how much of what I filmed actually got filmed, but, um... Hello. Months later, editing room, Tom. Here because I don't like what I said in the video on dynamic convergence. The average convergence board has 12 controls. Three controls each for top, bottom, left and right sides. The right side controls are typically all tuned inductors and the rest are typically all potentiometers. You want to adjust the top and bottom controls first and you want to adjust top and bottom simultaneously. Top and bottom typically has RG horizontal lines, RG vertical lines, and blue horizontal lines. You want to adjust them in pairs so do RG horizontal top and bottom, then RG vertical top and bottom, then blue horizontal top and bottom. And you want to adjust top and bottom simultaneously to get best convergence. Once you've worked down the top and bottom controls in that order, you then go to the left and right side controls. At this point in the video, I've done top and bottom and am shifting over to left and right. Typically, you do left and right in the order of RG horizontal lines left and right, RG vertical lines left and right, and blue horizontal lines left and right. When you adjust the tuned inductors, use a plastic hex adjustment tool for specifically made for them. Do not use a metal hex key. You will crack your slugs, and then you will be in all kinds of worlds of trouble that you don't want to be in. Also, ignore this retrace line that's very green there. That's a side effect of the test pattern generator. And one of my slugs is cracked. Oh, dang. Is the blue slug stuck too? started moving. Sticky is all heck, but well, I'll be. The two slugs I fought were cracked aren't actually cracked. They're just incredibly sticky. So what I did is I sprayed some deoxid control cleaner into the slug forms. This deoxid's pretty good at dissolving wax, and wax is one of the things that can get inside slugs and other things, and uh, stick them where they don't want to turn. So that actually worked excellently well. Now I'll move on to the rest of this. So I'm going to do horizontal, vertical, and then blue according to the service manual. So horizontal. Not bad. Vertical. That's 
about as good as that's going to be. And then blue. Sometimes on the dynamic don't have the right range, you can use the static to cheat things on the screen a little bit better, like I just did there. So, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Also, ignore this green line here, that is a a retrace bar that is some kind of a weird interaction between the test pan generator and the set. You see how it's not really associated with any of the other bars when I'm moving the horizontal hold. It's just a weird side effect of life. So let's go over to our test pattern. Better antenna. Oh, and I need fine tuning. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, how do I? So, how do I position the antenna to minimize multi-path reception, giving me a bad looking picture because of strange quirks of RF reflections? Yeah, that's starting to look a lot more right. That looks pretty good. I'm going to uh, fix a big horrid crack right here in the back and put the back on this set and call it done. So I do believe this is working properly now. Oh, the 
phone notifications coming from the TV because I'm using my phone to feed audio into my modulator. That's why it doesn't sound quite like it's coming from my pocket. That makes sense now. one thing I never looked at as I just randomly waste film So slightly I got it better. That's about as good as this thing's gonna be able to do. And let's be frank, it's doing great. as good as I can ask this set to operate if I'm frank. I might be able to make the circle just a pinch more linear if I got really nitpicky, but I should just be happy. This is good. If you want to see the uh, cataract removal on this set, go check out the video in the uh, top corner right there.